Hello, everyone. Welcome to your Dog's Friends webinar series. Um, I hope that you're as excited as I am about today's webinar, the six M's of treating any behavior problem. I have a feeling that we're going to have an opportunity to dissect the brain of a veterinary behaviorist. We'll see, but we should get a good idea of, of how they look at issues. Um, let me introduce you to our speaker. Dr. Amy Pike is a veterinary behaviorist and the co-owner of Animal Behavior Wellness Center with dog trainers, a boarded behavior nurse, and veterinary behavior residents part of the team. The center has two locations, Fairfax and Richmond, Virginia. Now, her background is really interesting. As a captain in the Army, Dr. Pike first worked with military dogs, but then she spent three years in the residency program that's required to become one of what are now only 90 certified veterinary behaviorists in North America. Dr. Pike has written articles for veterinary journals, is a member of the Fear Free Advisory Committee, and presents at veterinary conferences across the country. In her Fairfax Center, she sees pets with various behavior disorders that range from mild fears to extreme aggression, compulsive disorders, and panic disorders. Dr. Pike is also working to expand prevention services with her support staff by providing socialization classes and patient handling workshops for other veterinary professionals. Um, I am really pleased to have her here today. I'm going to make a few announcements first, though. One is, if you're in attendance, please remember to use chat for your questions. Everyone is muted. And we will get to as many questions as possible at the end of the webinar. I also need to talk to you about donations, much as I hate doing this. Um, for those of you who are in attendance, I will put up the donations uh, link so you can, can donate during or after the webinar. But also for you in attendance and everyone watching on video, you can find a link for donations in the upper right-hand corner of our homepage on the website. Um, we are a nonprofit and our expenses have, have gone up exponentially while the need for our services have increased too. So any donations you can make will help support our free services, including these webinars. I know that you will learn a lot today, enough from me. So over to you, Dr. Pike. Excellent, thank you, Deborah. I appreciate it. Um, as you said, I'm gonna be talking about the six M's of treating any behavior problem. And I was telling Deborah before we got started here that my own staff uh, saw the advertisement for this webinar and they were like, what are the six M's, Dr. Pike? So, so I'm even surprising them a little bit. Um, they had some really good guesses, including martinis um, and meatballs, um, which I would take martinis as part of treating the behavior problem. But all right, let's go ahead and get some get started. So what kind of behavior concerns am I talking about? I really am talking about any type of behavior issue that you may be having problems with in your pet. And this applies to dogs, cats, ferrets, birds, whatever species that you actually have. Um, it includes fears and phobias, anxiety, aggression, compulsive disorders like um, tail chasing or um, blanket sucking in Dobermans. Also includes panic disorders like separation anxiety, uh, thunderstorm and firework phobias, and then even just nuisance behaviors. Let's say the dog counter surfs or jumps up on your guests um, because it's really excited to see new people. So and this is going to be basically any behavior concern in your pets. So the first M is management. So what does management accomplish? Number one, it prevents the practice of problematic behaviors. So if you prevent that practice, we're going to decrease and eliminate any sort of reinforcement or punishment history with that. 
it's going to avoid further incidences. So number one, the, um, you know, especially when it comes to aggression, we're going to avoid um, that and provide immediate safety for whoever um, the target of that aggression is. It can absolutely decrease the pet's overall stress and arousal. So if your pet is scared of people and is barking out the window all the time, then if we eliminate the possibility that they can see or hear anything outside, they're gonna be less stressed and aroused in general. And it's also gonna set up the environment for success for the pet. So if we have, you know, let's say counter surfer, we're gonna not leave the cheesecake or the brownies um, on the counter. And therefore we're not gonna um, allow that pet to reinforce itself if it actually does counter surf. So there are a lot of different management strategies out there. So I um, included some of our favorites that we use in the practice. The first one being muzzles. So we are very big proponents of basket muzzle training. So this is a picture of sort of all the different types of muzzles that are out there. But I don't recommend using um, this mesh fronted one or this cloth muzzle for a couple of reasons. Actually, the only time I've ever recommended this mesh fronted muzzle was recently um, here in the DC area when we had the cicada, the 17 year periodic cicadas come out because this really did eliminate any possibility from dogs being able to ingest those, which apparently they were quite the tasty treat for many of our patients. Um, but the basket muzzles are the ones that we typically use um, within the practice. So the nice thing about a basket muzzle is they, once they are comfortable wearing this, they can pant, they can take treats, they can stick their whole face into a bowl of water and actually lap water up through it. So it's a really nice management strategy. Now it doesn't necessarily mean that you can then put that animal in a situation where it wants to or needs to bite, but it's gonna be for unavoidable situations. Like the dog has to go to the veterinary clinic and it, it gets aggressive because it's scared. And therefore we're gonna make sure that everybody stays safe at the clinic. This is my um, little dog who is unfortunately no longer with us, um, Mr. Wilson, he is modeling the um, thunder cap. So that is not a total blinder, but it does dampen visual signals. So this can be really um, successful for dogs that uh, may lunge if they're in the car and they're you know lunging at passing bikes or people on the sidewalk, that type of thing. It can even work really well for dogs that are reactive on leash so that owners have can actually see, let's say another dog coming towards them long before your pet recognizes that that's a dog. So it allows us to, to have our management, other management type things under control. The other area that I use this in very commonly is with veterinary visits. So it is not a muzzle, but that piece over his nose is quite elastic. He can totally open his mouth. So it's not gonna prevent him from biting, but what it does prevent him from seeing is that I have this doctor in a white coat with a stethoscope coming towards me. All he sees is the outline of a human. And so he doesn't necessarily know that it's a um, veterinarian. This is another management tool um, with Wilson modeling. This is a gentle leader head collar, and this is just going to help prevent lunging and pulling on leash. So that's a management tool. I'm a big proponent of exercise pens, um, actually for kids, not necessarily for dogs, depending on the dog, but I used exercise pens for my children so that when I had to maybe step away and take a phone call or cook dinner, I could put the kids into the exercise pen and know that they were safe and that they weren't going to, you know, crawl off or go try and pull ears or tails or whatever. A crate and teaching confinement is another really good strategy for management. The dog doesn't have to meet the cable guy. And so when the cable guy comes over, we just put the dog in the crate and um, they're not going to be nervous and, you know, try and bite our workers in the household. Um, and then another big thing that we use are baby gates. So making sure that we have, um, you know, especially for kids and dogs, but also for, let's say we have inner dog aggression in the house. We may keep one dog um, on one side of the home or on one level of the house and the other dog on the other side using baby gates. So those are just all management strategies and tools. 
In terms of other things that we can do for management, I mentioned blocking visual and auditory triggers for that dog that, you know, barks at everything that goes by. We can use window film that is designed for um, bathrooms. So the windows basically are blocked from any sort of um, visual stimulus, but light can still come in. So a lot of owners prefer this to like, hey, just shut your blinds, shut your curtains, because then you're not living in the dark. Um, and the window film is just from the human perspective, a little bit nicer. You can also play white, pink, or brown noise. They have, um, you know, actual machines that you can buy. They're traditionally designed for infants. So you put, you know, white noise on so it drowns out so they can take a nice nap um, without hearing everything that's going on in the house. They're, you know, on your Spotify app, on your phone, your, maybe your Amazon Alexa device. You can always play white, pink, or brown noise to help kind of drown out some of the ambient noise, whether that be dogs barking down the street or, you know, the sound of um, the collar jingling as the dog walks by with its owner. You can also play classical music. So classical music isn't really designed necessarily to drown out ambient noise, but specifically to help calm the animal um, as kind of another management strategy. So I recommend using through a dog's ear and you can play this on Spotify. You can play it on your Amazon Alexa device. Um, you can also buy uh, what's called an iCalm and it's just a little Bluetooth speaker that you can plug into your computer and it, all it plays is through a dog's ear. We can avoid certain locations, outings, things. You know, when I first got my um, current giant schnauzer that we have, I really wanted to be able to take him to wineries and breweries and on outings like that as a family. And then unfortunately, he has a lot of stranger danger. And so he's not that dog. And so when I go to a winery with my, you know, girlfriends, yeah, it would be great if I took him, but he doesn't enjoy it. So he stays home. Okay. So we can just avoid those certain types of things. Again, if we're going to, you know, we have a dog that counter surfs, we're going to put away the food. The microwave is a great place um, to store food like that you don't want your dog to get. Um, putting up shoes if the dog destroys shoes when they're home alone, making sure that the laundry is put away so they can't access dirty underwear, dirty socks, all those kinds of things. We can avoid certain tasks. So if a dog has issues with, let's say, nail trims, then we're going to avoid doing those unless the patient is sedated. And we can safely do that um, when they're not stressed because they are none the wiser that we're doing that. And then I do recommend advertising your management. So I try, I didn't purposefully block out the whole word because um, the bandana, I do love this bandana and actually own it myself for um, Ike the Giant Schnauzer to remind my guests and, um, and sometimes my kids that he doesn't like to be touched. So he is one that doesn't really like handling, especially from strangers. And so this just says, hey, just a big advertisement of, you know, hey, don't touch him. Okay. Um, the other one, I actually do have this sign on my front door. And so this helps when it comes to like, you know, UPS, Amazon, FedEx, they don't ring or knock. And if I know someone's coming over, they actually will text me. So I'm just helping my management um, be advertised to the world. What else can we do? In terms of management, the, the management is not necessarily a replacement for training. Um, management may involve some level of training actually to accomplish too. So like with basket muzzle, we have to train the dog to actually accept the wearing of that muzzle. Um, management can actually solve a lot of issues. And I put, put that in quotes because while it doesn't really solve the underlying problem, right? We're not solving the stranger danger by um, putting the dog in a crate or you know blocking visual stimulus out front, but it can really avoid those problems. And honestly, a lot of owners are quite happy with just management. Oh, in fact, it's so funny because like when I tell people like your dog doesn't have to meet the cable guy or the AC repairman, they're like, 
it's okay to put my dog in a crate. And like, of course it's okay to put your dog in a crate. Like, yeah, it's so funny how people think like my dog must be everyone. So, so once you tell them that it's like, Oh, whew, okay, well we can solve that problem. I manage a lot in my own home. So when my kids have friends over, Ike is crated. Um, in fact, all my dogs are crated, honestly, when my friends, uh, when my kids have friends over, because I have one dog that jumps in excitement and loves to chase kids when they're, you know, screaming and, and running. He loves to run after them and he's happy about it. He's not a dog that would become aggressive with them, but it's kind of annoying, honestly. And so everybody just gets crated when, when people come over. Can I train through that? Absolutely. But do I really want to after I'm, you know, had a busy day at work or I just really kind of want to enjoy my company? Probably not. So I can manage that. So if something is really avoidable, like I don't have to take Ike to the wineries, why would I go any further? All right. Could I train him to be comfortable at the winery? Sure, probably, but I'd have to do a lot of, you know, working on desensitization and counter conditioning. And let's be honest, that's a lot of work. And so why really would I bother when it's really for me, not for him? So, but if it's something that isn't avoidable, veterinary visits, um, you know, people in the house that the dog is nervous about um, in terms of like family members that actually live there, we absolutely need to proceed with the following five M's. The second M that every single patient gets um, and every single animal should have is mental enrichment. So what does mental enrichment accomplish? Number one, it is important to the health and well-being of all animals. Zoos do a lot of mental enrichment for um, their captive animals because it's really important that they're able to do exploratory behaviors and think through problems and potentially hunt for their food. Cats in our household do a whole lot of nothing half the time because people don't necessarily provide cats with a lot of mental enrichment, but cats in the wild like to hunt. They hunt anywhere from 20 to 24 times per day. And only about half of those hunts are successful. And so giving them that mental stimulation of hunting toys that they have to run around the house and find and, um, you know, kill their, kill their prey, so to speak, where they, you know, dump out the little kibbles that we're giving them. And so that gives them more natural type behaviors to perform. But also using their cognitive brain means that they're not using their emotional brain. So there are, there are definite parts of the brain that do various functions. It's not just the whole brain does everything. So if you think this is, this is a um, picture of a brain, hopefully you can see this on the camera. So this is the cortex. This is the outer portion of the brain. This is our thinking brain. And this is what's called the amygdala. The amygdala is our emotional brain. So it's totally separate from the cortex. Now there are connections, but this is very sort of a rudimentary um, way of thinking of this. And then this is our brainstem. That's a really primitive portion of our brain. Well, when you are not using your cortex, you are only using your amygdala and your brainstem. And we want these dogs to be able, and, and any animal that I'm treating, to be able to use their cognitive brain. And in order to do mental enrichment, they have to engage that cognition. And if they're engaging that cognition, they're much less likely to be having an emotional problem at the time, less likely to be anxious, less likely to use aggression as a behavioral strategy, etc. But also a stimulated brain leads to a tired animal. So, you know, I think I hear this a lot, a lot from trainers, um, not necessarily good trainers, by the way, that say, oh, you have to exercise the pet, you have to, you know, take it out for a two mile run, that's a border collie, it needs a job, right? Well, these animals and, and people too, if we exercise, we're not tired afterwards. If I went out and went for a run right now, I'd be energized, right? I'd be ready to tackle my day, want to, you know, hop in the shower and then get my checklist done, run my errands. But if I sit at my desk for four to six hours, I'm exhausted afterwards. All I want is a nap. And so that's because my cognitive brain uses up way more energy than my muscles actually do. And so we need to make sure that we stimulate these animals in a way that actually makes them more tired versus energizes them. So some of our mental enrichment strategies include feeder toys, trick training, and nose work. 
So here are some really common um, feeder toys and um, mental enrichment strategies. So up here, this dog has to twist these little bones to expose the um, kibble that's hidden in there. And every animal should be fed out of a feeder toy. You are wasting a precious resource if you are feeding your dog out of a bowl because you might as well get twice daily mental um, enrichment from their um, kibble that they have to eat or their food. This is a topple, one of my new favorite um, things, even more so than a Kong because they don't get as frustrated with this um, as they can with a Kong. You can stuff kibble in here, peanut butter, yogurt, um, canned dog food, and the dog has to really work at um, getting the food out. This one, the kibble goes in this little roller and the, they have to spin it either with their paw or their nose. And then this one too for cats is really good because then once the kibble comes down here in this little maze, they use their, their hand, their paw to get um, the food out of the little maze there. This is a snuffle mat. This is a really easy way to just sprinkle kibble or treats inside this so the dog has to engage their nose and find um, the food. This is what I like to call the world snuffle mat. So you can toss kibble out in the yard in your grass and the dog has to go find it um, for breakfast. Or my favorite thing to do is when it's snowed, especially like that fresh powdery snow, throwing the dog's kibble out there so that they have to you know, shove their nose down in to find every little piece of kibble that's fallen down through the fresh powder. You can also do games like you know, hide a treat under a cup and the dog has to figure out which cup is it underneath right? You take your dog into another room, you hide the treat under the cup, you bring the dog out and it has to figure out what cup it's under. So, so just easy ways at home that you can engage them mentally. But trick training is one of my other favorite ways to do this too. And one of my absolutely favorite YouTube channels besides your dog's friend is Kiko Pup. She's a phenomenal trainer and she's got a lot of just very easy tricks that people can train their dog inside their house. So if it's raining, if just like it is right here right now, um, if it's snowing, you can stay inside and you can do some mental enrichment with your dog to tire them out when you can't necessarily get out to do some exercise. So my biggest thing about mental enrichment is it's not a replacement for exercise, but actually it can be better than exercise for a lot of dogs. Ike Pike does not like um, strangers, so going on a walk, he can be quite reactive. And so he actually doesn't enjoy going for walks. He likes a good um, fetch game in the backyard. We do a lot of mental stimulation throughout the day in order to help um, get him a little bit more tired. But also some of our mental enrichment can involve some level of training. So obviously trick training, right? Um, I will do husbandry training with Ike a lot of times um, as a way to engage him mentally. And so, so that is partially training, but you can easily, easily accomplish mental enrichment without a whole lot of training too. So the third M is modification of behavior. And this is the training. So modification of behavior strategies, we have operant conditioning, which we'll talk about, and or desensitization and classical counter conditioning, which very commonly go together, which is why I've paired them here. So let's talk about operant conditioning. So operant conditioning is where the animal is essentially operating on their environment. They have to do something in order to receive a consequence. So when it comes to um, doing operant conditioning, we call it uh, the A, B, and C. So we have our antecedents. Our antecedents can be cues, commands, um, the environment, certain triggers, um, as well as our training methods. The dog performs a behavior and then a consequence happens. So, and as far as those consequences are concerned, we have positive reinforcement. Positive reinforcement is where we apply something good to the situation. I give the dog a treat the moment that its little tush hits the ground because I'm trying to train it to sit and I'm going to increase the likelihood of that behavior happening in the future. Negative punishment or minus P that you see there, basically you take away the good stuff in order to decrease a behavior. So let's say the dog is jumping on me at the front door. I'm going to turn my back and totally take my attention away in order to decrease the behavior of jumping. So those are the only two types of operant consequences that we wanna use because they don't increase fear and anxiety and they are humane for the animal. And as far as the other 
into um, the quadrants of uh, learning theory consequences, we can have positive punishment. So I always want to think about positive as being mathematical, not something good. So, so it's not an emotion like this is good punishment. It is actually we're adding something to the situation. So positive punishment means bad stuff is added in order to decrease the behavior. So let's take the example of the dog jumping on me. That would be the dog jumps on me and I use the shock collar to shock it. I'm trying to decrease the behavior of jumping by applying a shock, right? But it is considered inhumane and it's banned in many, um, in many countries. So we don't wanna use those types of techniques. And then um, negative punishment or negative reinforcement rather means we are taking bad stuff away in order to increase a behavior. So that's the common scenario for that is the dog is um, pulling on the leash and it's got a prong collar on. We're going the, the dog backs up and that um, you know punishment of the prong collar is removed. We're going to increase the likelihood of the behavior of not pulling. Okay. But again, why they're in green and why they're in red here on this um, lovely Lily Chin graphic is because we only want to use positive reinforcement and negative punishment. So I really didn't already go kind of through all of these, but this is just another graphic by Lily. And if you don't, if you aren't familiar with Lily's, um, Lily Chen's graphics, they are phenomenal. You can search them on Google images. Uh, she also has her own website and she's got a great, a couple great books out actually. Um, my new favorite one is her uh, book on body language showing um, dogs and their different body language and it's available on Amazon. But again, just to kind of reiterate, positive reinforcement is adding good stuff to increase the behavior. Negative punishment is uh, delaying good stuff or removing good stuff in order to decrease the behavior. And those are the only two that we want to use. This is just another graphic by Lily um, looking at positive reinforcement dog training and why we want to use these types of methods. So number one, um, the positive reinforcement training can help the dog develop self-control. So if the dog wants a treat, they're going to perform a behavior such as a sit or a down in order to receive the good consequence. It's also going to develop a trusting relationship. Let's say, you know, the dog wants its ball thrown. Okay, you give me your ball, you drop it, um, and then I'm going to throw your ball. So that gives them that trust of my human is predictable and structured and actually gives me really amazing things when I comply with this cue. It's also going to help develop the dog's self-confidence. So, so if the dog is able to perform behaviors on its own, especially not necessarily even cued and then get receives good things that can really boost self-confidence versus punishment can actually really negatively impact a dog's self-confidence. And the same is true in humans. If you think about your boss, right? Like if your boss was just constantly like, oh, you did this wrong. Oh God, you did this wrong. You did this wrong. You did this wrong. That's going to really affect you in a negative way, right? But if your boss is like, you know what? You did such a great job on that proposal last week. Let's give you a bonus. How amazing does that feel, right? So just think about yourself as kind of the, um, you know, the boss that you want to be or the parent that you want to be for your pet. So what is desensitization? So desensitization is where we expose a learner, and in, in this particular graphic, it, this is a dog, to a trigger that, it, that causes it stress at a distance with an intensity level that the animal is able to remain relaxed. And then we repeat that exposure at that level until we're able to either increase the intensity or decrease the distance to that trigger. So, so you can see in this graphic on the top, the dog um, on the left is our learner and he's going, whoa, this scary dog is way too close. I'm showing signs of aggression. So we move that scary dog a little bit further away. And now we're just showing what we call defensive aggression. Um, it says fear signals on here, but um, I like to use this as defensive because this dog still could become aggressive, but again, still too close because the dog is showing an emotion that we don't want them to have. And then now we have our learner at a distance from their scary trigger that they are relaxed 
they may be alert to that. They notice it, but they'll be willing to take treats during that time, respond to cues during, um, during that uh, moment, et cetera. So we repeat it exposure at this level in order to desensitize them to their scary trigger. We oftentimes pair desensitization with classical counter conditioning and classical counter conditioning is also called Pavlovian conditioning because it is what Pavlov discovered when he rang the bell and dogs would salivate. So we're using a primary reinforcer such as food to indicate that boy, you shouldn't be so worried about that trigger um, in front of you because every time you see a dog, your mom or dad gives you chicken, right? And so whew, dogs either become the scene of a dog on a leash walk either becomes neutral to you or actually becomes really exciting because you know, you anticipate that, oh my gosh, chicken is coming because I see a dog, right? So that's desensitization and classical counter conditioning. So I like this graphic by Suzanne Clothier um, to kind of understand thresholds. So basically every behavior that we perform has a threshold. Above the threshold, we're gonna see the behavior and below we don't. And when we're doing desensitization counter conditioning, we need to make sure that the animal is below the threshold for reaction. So we need to, if the animal isn't, the trigger may be too intense. And so how we can modify that is we may be able to increase distance, to that trigger or shorten the duration of exposure to it. If the trigger is too close, we may be able to decrease the intensity of that trigger or shorten the duration of exposure. And if we're dealing with the trigger for too long, let's say a dog is thunderstorm phobic and that storm goes on woo, for hours, we may be able to uh, increase the distance. So get the dog away from the window, go into the basement and decrease the intensity at that time too, by maybe turning on some white noise for that animal. So, so those are the ways that we can modify the, um, how we're doing desensitization and counter conditioning in order to make sure that we're always keeping our learners under threshold. All right, so the fourth M is medication and products. And these would only be appropriate if the um, behavior that we're trying to change is a result of an emotional underpinning that is a negative emotion. So let's say the dog is jumping on visitors because it's super, super excited. Medication and products are not appropriate, okay? So, but if the dog is jumping on a visitor because it's like, oh my God, you're scary, stay away, stay away, stay away medication and products can often help in order to decrease the emotional underpinning. As far as the goals of medication and products, the first one that we're gonna hopefully accomplish is to decrease the intensity of the behavior. And it's really because we're decreasing the intensity of that emotion that's driving that behavior. We're decreasing the anxiety associated with meeting new people or people coming through our front door. We're hopefully gonna decrease the frequency of the behavior. Oftentimes frequency though comes with, um, with the medication products in conjunction with the training, sort of on the backside. But then we're also gonna decrease the time it takes to recover after an animal is triggered. So let's say we push that patient up over threshold because we got way too close to the dog on a walk. And medication products can help that animal recover and come back down to their baseline so that we are now under threshold, the entire rest of the walk isn't ruined because we're staying you know, highly aroused. Now, I always say it's never medication and products in a vacuum. It is always to be used in conjunction with behavior modification and training. So it's not just we hand over the Prozac and whew, the, you know, the behavior goes away. It really doesn't work that way. I wish it did. Um, I'd, I'd probably be a lot more uh, rich if that were the case. But um, in terms of types of medications that we have or, and products, we have a daily medication or product. So something that is given every single day, no matter what, oftentimes those types of products do take a longer period of time to see effect. So Prozac is considered a daily medication and it does take about four weeks to see full effect. Um, many of our, even our nutraceuticals um, and pheromones can take time to see full effect. But then we also have our event-based um, products or medications, and these are given just prior to a stressor. 
So let's say we are going to have the, um, you know, Super Bowl party at our house and, whew, you know, the dogs are going to be really stressed out. Okay. Before um, people come over about 90 minutes in advance, we give an event-based medication that can really help um, take down the arousal stress associated with what's going to happen or commonly, you know, thunderstorms. If we can get a, an event-based medication on board before the storm starts, then it can really help decrease the arousal and anxiety associated with thunderstorm phobia. In terms of our common side effects, um, most often when it comes to any sort of psychotropic or psychoactive medication or product, it does tend to be gastrointestinal. And that tends to be because we have more serotonin receptors in our gut than in the rest of our body to include in our brain. So if you think about when you get nervous, the first thing that happens is you get those butterflies in your tummy, right? And GI is a, uh, is a very, very common consequence of stress as well as um, our medications. So we may see vomiting, loose stool, oftentimes lack of appetite. And this is especially true in um, animals that are already sort of picky and in animals where anxiety actually suppresses their appetite too. They won't eat when they're anxious. And then there are certainly others. I always say you never discount it when it comes to psychoactive medications as far as side effect is concerned. Um, while they are very, very rare, really the whole gamut of anything could potentially happen. Um, the nice thing about all the medications that I use um, in our practice and our products as well is how safe they are. They don't cause long-term organ damage. They can be used lifelong very safely. We do recommend laboratory work in our, our veterinary patients that are on a daily medication. And the reason being is because I need to be aware of, you know, does this dog have liver disease or kidney disease that may, may make um, the metabolism and excretion of the metabolites harder to do for that particular pet. And so maybe I need to reduce my dosage of my medications or pick something that maybe doesn't rely on that organ system. So in with dogs in kidney disease, let's say their kidneys are less functional in terms of excreting byproducts through the bladder and so that we can pee out those metabolites. So I may pick a medication if I'm going for a daily medication like sertraline, which is the generic of Zoloft because sertraline does not rely on the kidneys to be excreted. It actually is excreted in the feces. And so, um, you know, those are the types of things that we always have to sort of take into account when it comes to our products, but overall they are incredibly safe, which is awesome. So some of our natural products that we have, we do have pheromones. So this is Adaptal um, Pheromone by Siva. What this is, is the maternal appeasing pheromone that mother dogs produce when they're nursing their puppies comes in a collar. You can see that little gray um, plastic collar looking thing. Um, it warms up with body heat and emits that pheromone, comes as a spray. And this is a really old slide. They now call this Adaptal Travel because one of the top things that we use this for is maybe to spray out the inside of your vehicle or a crate um, before transporting your pet. And then it also comes as a diffuser, kind of looks like a little blade plug-in. So let's say the dog has some confinement anxiety. We would plug in an Adaptal diffuser next to its crate. Maybe the dog would also wear the collar and we could even spray the inside of the crate out with that, um, that spray prior to exposing them and putting them in there for confinement training. We have a couple nutraceuticals that we, um, that we carry on our shelves. The first one being Zilkeen. Zilkeen is a, um, a protein, basically it's alpha-cazozapine is the active ingredient. And that alpha-cazozapine is a protein found in cow's milk. So if you've ever heard of the saying of drink a warm glass of milk before you go to bed, the reason is that alpha-cazozapine binds to the same receptors in our brains that Xanax and Valium do. So it has kind of an anti-panic response. Anxetane is an L-theanine supplement. L-theanine is an amino acid found in green tea. A lot of people drink green tea for its anti-anxiety properties. And the reason that this product works and that green tea helps with anxiety is because it increases serotonin, which is our coping neurotransmitter. It increases dopamine, which is our pleasure um, neurotransmitter. And then it also increases GABA. And GABA is our in primary inhibitory transmitter that dampens anxiety signals to the brain. 
Diet and nutrition can play an important role um, when it comes to our patients. The first thing that we want to make sure is we're always feeding a high quality diet to our animals and our pets. Um, one study, it's called the CADE study. Um, they were looking at um, long-term outcomes with dogs with cognitive dysfunction. And what they found was dogs that were fed a high quality diet were much less likely to have developed cognitive dysfunction than their, than their um, you know, compatriots that were not fed a high quality diet. And when I mean a high quality diet, it really was sort of the top four recommended um, by veterinary nutritionists. It's Purina's um, ProPlan and their focus lines, the Royal Canaan diets, Hill Science diets, um, Oh, that was the ones, Purina Pro Plan, Purina Focus, and then Royal Canaan and Hills. And so those versus like your, you know, uh, dog chow or um, even like the Kirkland's brand or, you know, any of the ones that are sort of not the um, AFCO certified top ones uh, recommended by veterinarians. So it's very important that we do feed those high quality diets. Um, the other thing we wanna make sure is that those diets contain grains. So the grain free um, sort of trend amongst uh, dog foods and, um, and actually cat foods too, was a marketing ploy by some of the boutique type um, dog food companies. So Blue Buffalo, um, gosh, wellness, core, those, those types of ones, and Akina, um, dogs don't actually have gluten sensitivity. So that was a marketing thing by those companies that said, oh, gosh, the gluten-free tra trend is so, you know, kitschy in humans, their pet owners are going to just glom onto this because they don't want their dogs to have grains either. Well, actually, dogs need grains. Cats need a little bit, but not as much as dogs do. And with those grain-free diets, they have actually been shown to cause um, a silent heart disease called dilated cardiomyopathy, where dogs actually drop dead from an enlarged heart. It's undetectable um, on when we listen with our stethoscopes. And so that is something that we want to make sure that that diet has grains in it for our dogs, especially. And then the other thing um, that is a common misconception when it comes to behavior issues is that if the dog has a behavior concern, you want to jack that protein up. They are not getting enough protein. And actually that is exactly the opposite of what we want. When it comes to protein absorption in our, um, in our bodies, we eat things and then we take those proteins and we make certain things within our body. When it comes to serotonin, our coping neurotransmitter, we actually take tryptophan, that's the precursor. So tryptophan is the precursor that we um, digest. And that's what a lot of people think of like when they think about Thanksgiving dinner because there's a high level of tryptophan in Turkey. So we take that tryptophan and we actually make serotonin in our bodies. And so, but the problem with tryptophan is that it is kind of low man on the totem pole when it comes to protein absorption. And so, when it comes to protein transporters in our, um, in our gut, they go, Ooh, there's all these other dietary proteins that I have to absorb first. And then if I have room, I'm going to absorb tryptophan. When we have a diet that is over about 24, 25%, the possibility um, decreases significantly that we're actually taking tryptophan and making serotonin. So we actually want to lower the protein content in animals with fear, anxiety, and stress, not increase it. Um, so we recommend a protein content less than 28%, make sure that that um, diet does contain grains. And actually, if you look for a grain containing food, um, most of their protein contents are actually 20 to 24%. That's kind of average um, across the board. There are also probiotics that can help with fear and anxiety. Um, and so this is ProPlan's uh, calming care. This is a particular bacteria called Bifidobacterium longum that um, has been shown in humans and a lot of different rodent models, as well as now dogs and cats to help with stress and anxiety. So interestingly enough, this bacteria communicates from the gut to the brain via the vagus nerve and helps to um, decrease anxiety. So this is a way that we can sort of naturally um, feed some good bacteria to the body. 
Now, those daily medications that we talked about, we actually only have two that are FDA approved for use in our veterinary patients. And these are the two. They're both FDA approved for separation anxiety in dogs only. So we have Clomacalm, um, which is a tricyclic antidepressant, and Reconcile, which is the SSRI. It's a, the dog equivalent of Prozac. Um, other than these two daily medications, we don't have anything else that we can use on a daily basis. Um, for um, issues, except for Anapril, which is also FDA approved for dogs with cognitive dysfunction, um, but not commonly used, which is why I didn't include it on the slide. But I literally use everything that they use in human psychiatry. So um, Zoloft, Effexor, um, Lexapro, if you've heard of it, we're using it, but these are the only two FDA approved medications that we actually have on the market. And then we have event medications. And we actually only have two that are FDA approved. Um, Cilio, which is a gel that is FDA approved for um, storm and noise phobias. So with this gel, you put it inside the animal's cheek pouch. So just kind of right in that little pouch right there. It absorbs through the mucous membranes directly into the bloodstream. And so that's why it's really nice for storms because a storm crops up suddenly like it did just did here. We can administer the cilio and within 10 to 15 minutes, we can have a nice relaxed pet. Whereas most of our oral um, tablet or capsule medications like trazodone, gabapentin, clonidine, um, as well as Pexion can take anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes. Um, Pexion is also FDA approved for storm and noise phobias in dogs, but is actually not actually out on the market yet. Um, so they are currently uh, ramping up production of that because it did get FDA approval and hopefully we'll be, back, we'll be out in 2022. But just like we use everything on our daily side, we use all of the same event-based medications that they do in human psychiatry as well, including trazodone, gabapentin, clonidine, um, benzodiazepines like Ativan, Valium, Xanax, and even our beta blockers um, can help decrease panic responses. So number five is to monitor. So we've gone through kind of the meat and potatoes of how to treat, but we definitely want to um, monitor and see how they're doing. We do recommend that owners journal um, to kind of, you know, so they can track trends there themselves, but also so that they know, you know, over the course of time, what have we seen? You know, sometimes I'll have owners scale it on a one to 10, like how was your walk today? Um, you know, 10 being the, the worst, one being the best or whatever the owner wants to do. And then we can kind of see, you know, where are our trends? Was there, you know, was the walk worse because you went midday when there are a lot of people out or was it better when you went at night because, you know, the dark can be kind of concealing for some animals. They actually find it less stressful, um, which not true for everybody, but it can happen. Um, definitely want to make sure that you're checking in with professionals. So if you're working with a trainer, or you're working with a veterinarian or veterinary behaviorist, making sure that you frequently check in with them to see, um, to let them know how things are going. I always tell my owners, I don't know if you don't tell me, right? I give you my treatment plan and you go home and implement it. But if things aren't going well, I don't just automatically know that, right? I need to be able to um, be aware of what, what you're dealing with, if anything else has come up, et cetera. I also recommend um, videoing any training sessions. This, this is true for dog trainers as well as um, myself and um, the owners because you oftentimes don't realize your mistakes until you're watching it later. So um, there's a video that I like to use um, uh, commonly in my lectures, and it's one of my technicians, one of my former technicians um, doing muzzle training. And she was doing muzzle training with her dog and the dog was being shaped into the muzzle. And so she would hold the muzzle out and the dog would, you know, shove its face into the muzzle and get a treat. And you could see when, when she went back to watch that video, you could see the dog's body language was super happy and excited and a loose waggy tail when he was shoving his face in. But as soon as she went to put the straps on, he froze. His tail stopped wagging. Now he tolerated it. He stayed there. She was allowed, you know, she's allowed to put the straps up, but I, we would have liked to have seen much more happy body language, which means she probably went too far too fast. Okay. So without doing, looking back at that, she would have never known. Um, 
Again, I like to grade reactions um, on a scale, like of in the intensity, the frequency, and the recovery. And then now we actually have the availability to do fecal cortisol testing. So cortisol is our stress hormone. Every single time we have a stress response, our adrenal glands do an excessive burst of cortisol into the bloodstream. And once we're done using that cortisol, we kind of package it up and defecate it out. And so with a blood test for cortisol, I could tell you how stressed that animal is at that very moment of that blood, uh, of that blood draw. But with a poop sample, I can tell you how stressed that animal has been over the last four weeks. So it's a chronic stress measurement. And one other way that we can monitor for how is our protocol going for this animal, right? Behavior is very subjective. We're gonna, you know, we're, we ask the owners like, is it better? And some of the owners are like, I have no idea. Right. And especially if, you know, we talk to them and they just had a terrible, terrible walk with their dog, they're going to be like, nothing's better. Nothing's working. Um, when in reality they had, you know, three and a half weeks of great walks with the dog and only one really terrible walk right before we talk to them, we can actually tell that with that fecal cortisol testing, because we're going to see how well the dog has been doing overall. So it's a really nice um, tool that we have now as veterinary behaviorists to be able to monitor our patients. And the sixth M is modify the plan. So I always, like I said, we want to make sure that we have people checking in with us because even if I am developing a treatment plan that I think is going to be, you know, the best thing ever, maybe the owner can't implement it. Maybe the animal doesn't like to take the pills and they're struggling getting the medication into them. Maybe the medication is having side effects. Sometimes with medications and products, there are cases where we don't see any effect at all. So it's like they're taking a sugar pill. So we need to be able to modify that plan according to the patient. We want to make sure that we reevaluate um, management and enrichment strategies. Maybe we said, all right, put a baby gate up at this, this area of your house to keep the two dogs separate, but the dogs are fighting over the baby gate. Okay, well, now we have to have two baby gates, basically a neutral zone in between the two dogs and one dog on one side of the baby gate and one dog on the other side of the other baby gate. So we need to make sure that we reevaluate evaluate what we're doing for them. If the enrichment is going poorly, like they're unable, maybe let's say the feeder toy is too complicated. We need to make sure that we are testing to see, you know, maybe we need something a little easier or if the dog is destructive, all right, we need something that's a little bit more durable as far as enrichment is concerned for that pet. So we may have to take a couple steps back in our training plan. Remember that uh, video that I said about Brittany with her um, muzzle training? You know, we noticed that, oh gosh, you know, she really went too, too fast on that. And so we took a few steps back, worked up more towards um, just a little bit of touching with the straps. And then we worked up um, back to where she was. Or, all right, we're doing great. We need to take the next two steps into further training, right? We need to know that. So we're gonna reevaluate our products. We're gonna make sure that we're monitoring the correct parameters. Um, and we're gonna also reevaluate re the owner's goals and move forward if we're able. We have a case right now that we're treating and um, the owner came to us for separation anxiety, but separation anxiety is no longer um, an issue, mostly because they are um, going to be teleworking for the next six months. They thought they were gonna go back in October, but here we are October, right? So we have six months really to kind of um, work on that. And a more pressing goal is they have family coming for Thanksgiving and Christmas, and the dog also has some stranger danger issues. So we need to make sure that we're constantly reevaluating what we're doing and how we're, you know, how we're treating this animal and, and really sort of refocus on our goals. And with that, those are the six M's to treating any behavior issue. So it looks like we have quite a bit of questions, Deborah, in the chat, and we have time to answer some. Yep, we sure do. And I'm sure we'll get more. <laughs> also, I want to thank all of you who've been participating. You've been giving a lot of great answers to each other. So that's been really helpful, too. Um, Okay, there's a question about what pink and brown noise are. Oh, yeah. So I just learned about these two. They're just a different type of frequency of noise. Um, and some people auditorily, I guess, prefer pink or brown noise to white noise. Um, I'm not exactly sure of the exact scientific difference, but it's 
it's out there. Okay, um, here's something from Andrea. She says, our dog is perfectly calm and friendly until visitors are at the front door leaving. Then she reacts very aggressively, quite suddenly. Yeah. Some behavior when we meet dogs out on the walk, mm -hmm. sniffs, et cetera, until the other dog starts to separate, leave, and then that very aggressive response again. Okay. So the first thing that I would recommend is that you really watch your dog's body language. They may not actually be friendly um, and excited to see your visitors or to meet that other dog. They are displaying things, maybe their ears are pinning back, they may be blinking really rapidly, they may, their tail may go down and tuck a little bit. Um, all of those signs are, I'm nervous here. And aggression, again, is just a strategy to minimize um, any fear and anxiety. And a very classic fear-based aggression response is, I can only aggress towards you when your back is turned because I'm too nervous to do anything when you're facing me. Um, so make sure that you're really identifying, is your dog actually happy to see people? And if it's not, the trigger is obviously the departure. So I would, number one, create your dog um, before your guests leave. So, all right, we're going to get ready to say goodbyes and all that kind of stuff. All right, let's, you know, Lucy or whatever your dog, I forget if you said the name, Deborah, but Lucy's going to go outside or Lucy's going to go in her crate. Um, and then we can say our goodbyes and she doesn't have to worry about that interaction at the door. Um, if it is the other dog leaving the situation, what I would try and do is lure her away first with a high, happy voice and a treat. Be like, come on, Lucy, let's go. And you guys actually do the leaving versus the other dog first. Um, but I, I suspect that you're probably going to start to notice some of the um, signs that your dog actually isn't as friendly as you thought um, they were. Okay. Um, Michelle wants to know about enrichment for dogs that are on a raw feeding diet. Yeah. Um, she got some good ideas from other people, like using a, a tube for feeding. Right. Yeah. Um, but are there other toys that yeah. would work? Yeah, any of the toys that have kind of a cup or a well um, could certainly hold um, a raw food diet. So, um, you know, a lot of dogs eat canned and kibble or like you said, a raw food. And there's a lot of different toys out there that can accommodate that. So lots of options. Um, also, I think there's some confusion about when to do this. Um, she has a reactive dog. And she's thinking that if you have them do something, it'll overcome their emotions. Not always. It's you only, can't yeah, do only. that at the last minute. No, exactly. The animal has to be under threshold. So, so while we sometimes use like a find it game um, where we're tossing treats or kibbles off into the, you know, grass or, you know, off the trail or sidewalk for a dog that's reactive, the dog has to be able to be under threshold. And so it's not like in the moment of reacting, we're going to be playing find it kind of thing for most dogs you've gone too far. So you definitely have to reassess what you're doing, but any type of enrichment honestly should be done multiple times per day um, and can be incorporated into your training, your desensitization, your, your counter conditioning, but um, that really needs to be focused more on the training aspect. Um, and Angela wants to know whether enrichment training helps specifically with neurotic um, slash anxious dogs. It can, absolutely. So um, when a dog is, quote, neurotic, oftentimes it's because they don't have enough to do. They don't know what to do with themselves. And that's sort of their manifestation of, I don't know what to do. So I'm just kind of going to like bounce off the walls and, you know, chase my tail and all that kind of stuff. So if you give them mental stimulation, but like I said, it also can increase um, and build confidence too, just like positive reinforcement training um, does. And so if you um, work on nose work with your dog or teach them tricks that can build their um, confidence level, which is absolutely going to help with fear and anxiety. Um, you mentioned Lily Chin. I have the book Doggy Language, A Dog Lover's Guide to Understanding Your Best Friend. It's short, it's easy, 
It's great. It is. It's great. Imagine a second book. Yeah. So she has, um, what else does she have out there? Well, she's mostly got drawings, I, I guess, for like Sophia Yin's books. So I guess she doesn't have her own, um, another standalone book that's just, just hers. But a lot of stuff that Sophia um, has put out, she's done it with um, Lily Chin's drawings. Okay. Um, there's a lot of back and forth on chat. Let me see. <laughs> you guys were active. Ah, what would you recommend for air travel with your dog to keep them calm during the flight? Yeah, so it's really going to depend on the level of anxiety for the pet. So um, some dogs, all they need is maybe some of the adaptal pheromones. Um, but if you have an animal that is really stressed, number one, about confinement, about noises, about being near other people, because they are going to have to, you know, be potentially facing two strangers um, under the seat in front of you, we may have to do medication. Um, and if the dog is in cargo, many airlines will not allow certain types of medications. And so we have to be really cautious about that. So I would definitely talk to your veterinarian and um, see what options are available based off your particular pet's level of concern. Okay, another um, participant gave her a link to to some studies, but you referred to a study that showed that a dog's health was better if grains were included in the diet. Yeah, so What's you can actually that find like? that. You can actually find that on the FDA website. Um, Okay, I think that's where she's going. Is that where she's going? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so they have a whole page dedicated to dilated cardiomyopathy and grain and grain-free foods. So, okay, um, is trazodone safe for daily use for months at a time? So there are some anecdotal reports of liver damage um, when using trazodone for daily use. Um, it is uncommon, but it can happen. But my philosophy is if your pet needs trazodone every single day, they need to be on a daily medication, something that really is designed to be used daily, like Prozac or Zoloft or one of those drugs. Do the bento create addictions as they do with humans? Benzos. Yeah. So the benzodiazepines, benzos. Yeah. yeah. So the, the reason that benzodiazepines are addictive for people is because they, um, what happens is that you downregulate the receptors over time. So you actually need more and more of the drug, um, higher doses of the drug in order to get the same effect. And yes, that absolutely can happen with our animals, although they don't become quote addicted, like they're not going to be fiending, you know, out trying to find the Xanax or whatever, but um, they are going to need higher and higher doses, the more frequently you use that. So we definitely want to avoid using those on a daily basis if we can, and only as needed um, for particular events. Karen wants to know how long the effects of cilio gel last. Yeah, they last two hours and it can be redosed every two hours for a max of five doses in a 24 hour period. Any tips for pets with anxiety, but also diet limitations? Now I don't yeah. try to understand this. The hydrolyzed, the hydrolyzed protein restriction for my dog makes it difficult to motivate change in behaviors. Yeah, so a lot of those hydrolyzed diets also come with a canned version and you can put the canned version in a squeeze tube. Um, they may be able, depending on the pet, they may be able to also um, eat cheese because it's not a meat protein. So it's gonna depend on if there's like a dairy allergy, uh, true dairy allergy um, in your animal. But also um, a lot of those animals um, can eat fruits and vegetables too, because they aren't meat proteins that we're talking about um, that are allergenic. So I have dogs that love watermelon um, as a treat, blueberries, um, you know, even like carrots, those types of things. So you'll definitely want to talk with your veterinarian or your dermatologist, whoever has prescribed the um, particular diet to see what else can you use. Um, because yeah, it can be hard if you're not able to use like a, you know, a hot dog or, or something that a quote unquote normal animal um, could take, but there are ways that we can do it. Ruth asks whether um, 
isn't it a problem with grain foods? Um, isn't a problem with grain foods a mite allergy? So if you are not storing it properly, that is a possibility. So you always want to store your foods in a um, sealed container. So you don't just want to open the bag and then, you know, maybe clip it on one side and hope for the best. Um, You definitely want to make sure that you're getting a sealed container because yes, you can absolutely get um, mite uh, mite infestations in those for sure. Um, Okay. We have, two different people who have questions about resource guarding. One just says, what advice for resource guarding slash aggression? The other one is um, my 10 month old Lhasa pup is resource guarding her food and any rug in my apartment. If I try to straighten a rug, she goes ballistic. If I take a step back or forward, she keeps reacting. If I stand still and talk calmly, she will let you know the the note the commotion will lessen yeah so with resource guarding we can manage a lot of those so like this little particular dog i would number one i would feed it in a closed bedroom or or bathroom or, or laundry room the dog doesn't have to be fed in the middle of the kitchen or and you don't have to interact with its food so just feed it behind closed doors um, and leave it alone until it's done eating you could pick up all those rugs um, and not have them in the household so that those are management strategies then we can can teach her um, also alternate behaviors, right? We can, um, instead of going after the rug, when I go to straighten it, maybe I want you to stay on your spot on the ottoman um, and work on some impulse control while I actually straighten the rug. So that's a whole training process um, with those types of um, issues. And if it's such an intensity level that you're unable to progress with any sort of training, um, and, and reasonable management, then you might need medications in order to decrease that anxiety. Resource guarding is a normal behavior in animals, but the abnormality is oftentimes the intensity with which we see it from, um, from our patients. And so that's where medication actually can play a role to decrease that anxiety that is driving that like constant need of like, this is mine, this is mine, this is mine. Hey, um, my dog is unpredictable with other dogs on walks. He is very big and I'm going to have a new dog sitter while I'm away. I want to put him back on a gentle leader, but when I did it before, it made a mark like a ridge on his nose. Did I have it adjusted improperly? You know, it depends on the dog. I have seen some dogs get that um, get that mark, especially uh, short-coated dogs like our pitties and labs. Um, you can also get the gentle leader, I forget what they call it. The, it's like the premier one, like the, you know, top of the line and it has more cushion underneath there, or you could even glue like, um, like lamb's wool or, you know, something comfortable underneath to, um, to help kind of minimize that. But it may be too tight too. So, you know, knowing, um, knowing how to fit it, gentle leader actually comes with a really nice, the, the um, head collar comes with a really nice training video. Um, you can probably find it on YouTube, I'm sure too, but it shows you how to fit it appropriately. It should, should be fairly loose and, and only come down to like the leather of the nose right there on the dog. And then the back piece, the back strap is actually where most of the tightness actually occurs. So you should only be able to get one or two fingers underneath the strap, um, beneath the base of the skull there. We also, this is, along the line of the reactivity, not the general leader, but we have some webinars on uh, reactivity on our videos page and um, some handouts under behavior issues. And you might be able to be able, you might be able to educate your dog walker a little bit too about what to do and what not to do while you're gone, because it, it could be a whole lot worse if, if your dog walker does the wrong things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, which is the best medication for a dog who is traveling in the hold of a plane for 12 hours? Um, she is shaking and panting. I, I think from looking at this, they're probably, the family's probably going to Europe. 
Yeah, I, I, we have a lot of, you know, State Department or military that go overseas with their pets. And yeah, those 12 hour flights, um, you know, it's going to depend on the dog, to be perfectly honest, um, their health issues, um, their age, blood work. So definitely talk to your veterinarian well in advance of your, um, your flight, because you are going to have to get them used to, you're also going to have to train them to travel in an airline crate. Um, those are different than a lot of what we usually use or what most people use is like the wire crates um, in their households. So you're going to have to train them to be confinement um, trained in one of those. And then there are medications that last about 10 to 12 hours, but it's not really a guarantee, unfortunately. Um, and so oftentimes we kind of just have to do the best we can. Sometimes I will use trazodone um, and gabapentin together, but again, it's, it's totally going to depend on the dog and, and what they have, you know, health wise, et cetera. Yeah. I feel bad for the dog. I was hoping they could, that there was something that would last 12 hours, but I guess. Yeah, unfortunately there's not. And you know, it, if the dog has issues being under the plane and cargo, I mean, I, I can imagine a lot of dogs do have that problem. I also suspect they probably have other anxiety issues too. Maybe, you know, maybe there is true confinement, anxiety, noise, phobia, so maybe that dog also needs to be on a daily medication. We can lower that dog's baseline overall to make that air travel a lot better. So um, definitely talk to your vet um, and seek, you know, their care or if they're not comfortable a veterinary behaviorist in your area. Do you know if dogs traveling in the hold of a plane are allowed or if there's room for something like through a dog's ear? If something like coming with them, can yeah, they have a piece of their owner's clothing? Can you know? Yeah, they could definitely have a piece of their owner's clothing. I doubt about like the through a dog's ear, only because how would it be plugged in and you know and play yeah. all that kind of stuff. Um, unfortunately, it's just not a great situation. Um, Pender Air is supposed to be one of the better um, airline uh, carriers as far as like. Uh, they sort of work with airline carriers in order to figure out like the best flights for your dog to make sure that's the shortest um, possible with like stops if there's stopovers in locations where they have like a vet on site and um, people that can get your dog out and walk it and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, it's not, it's not necessarily ideal. My husband's active duty and I always told him if he was going to go overseas, I probably wasn't going with him because I didn't want to have to take four dogs in cargo holds. So yeah. um, you know. what, what air did you say? Pender, P-E-N-V-E-R. Yeah, a lot of our State Department clients use them. Never heard of them. Okay, well, that would be good to look up. Um, all right, my lab pup will play at the park and then without warning gets very aggressive with another dog. Okay, it may be overstimulated. And so just like kids get, you know, really overstimulated if they're like, you know, they're having fun, they're having fun. And then blah, that can like kind of spill, spill over into aggression. If you notice it's kind of a time thing, I would, you know, shorten your times that you're able to play. Um, your dog may also not necessarily like playing with other dogs. He may do it, but it stresses him out. And so, you know, making sure that you understand body language, looking at uh, Lily Chen's doggy body language book that Deborah mentioned, that Deborah and I mentioned, and um, understanding maybe they're not really fit to go play with other dogs. And if that's the case, um, you might need to get some help from a professional. Along the same lines, will a dog ever bite you without warning? Absolutely. Um, and the reason is multi a multitude of things. Number one, if they've had punishment for warning signals, like if you punish the dog for growling, you just tell them no or knock it off or, hey, you're not allowed to do that or use a shot call or something like that. They're not dumb. They will learn to suppress those warning signals. And so then we do not have warning. Um, but I will say for the most part, most dogs give us plenty of nonverbal warning signals. We just don't recognize them as humans and um, it doesn't come out of nowhere. So there's been, there's been things in the past that we have missed um, or we are missing in that moment. Um, they don't just quote snap. 
so to speak. Um, Karen missed what you said about Kirkland Foods. Was it something good or bad? Oh, it's just not necessarily one of the um, top uh, high quality diets that we recommend. What are some reasons that a dog's behavior changes from day to day? For example, our dog will be great on leash with reactivity to other dogs one day and very reactive to multiple dogs the next. Yeah, that's because they're what we call trigger stacked. So they are already yeah. stressed out by something else, whether that be because, I don't know, they also have mild separation anxiety and you had to work that day. So they were, you know, you were gone all day and they were anxious in their crate or pacing around the, um, the house. And then you go take them for a walk. Well, they can't handle it. They're over their threshold. Um, it could also be that they're not feeling well. Maybe they have underlying, um, you know, gastrointestinal disease, like low level inflammatory bowel syndrome and their belly hurts, um, or they have osteoarthritis and they're, you know, mildly painful. And while you don't notice that necessarily with like a limp or an obvious, um, you know, external sign that is going to make them more irritable and therefore more reactive. So there's a lot of different reasons, but it's all comes down to they are over threshold. Um, we just have to figure out why. Um, Lisa has a dog who resource guards her and a new puppy in their family. Yeah. So that is definitely something that you are going to want to um, employ professional help with because resource guarding is the number one um, issue between two dogs in a household. And we want to get that under control. So making sure that you reach out to a positive reinforcement based trainer or a veterinary behaviorist um, to get that, um, make sure that we are addressing that ASAP. Any advice for a first time dog owner with a teething three month old puppy? <laughs> lots and lots of chew toys and opportunities for them to teeth and mouth on other things. And when they do mouth on you, um, completely taking your attention away. So don't, I don't recommend screaming or yelping like you're hurt because I think that just engages the animal. I would literally stand up, walk away, do what we call that, um, you know, that negative uh, punishment where we're taking away the good thing of your attention when you mouth on me. We also um, have a webinar that Sarah Stoikos did called something like living with your puppy and staying sane at the same time, <laughs> nice. something like that. Nice. I love it. So go on yep. the videos page under webinars and take a look at that, especially since you're a new owner. Yep. And our next webinar, or we have them every month for adopters and puppy parents will be on Sunday, November 7th. So you might want to register for that too. Would you have any ideas around why our dog would be more anxious in the morning rather than afternoon, evening? In the morning, yeah. you can also be more wary of my husband as opposed to me. Yeah, so it could be that, um, you know, if they're, if they associate the morning with everybody's kind of getting ready and it's a little bit, if it's anything like my household, it's a little bit chaotic. People are getting their stuff, they're packing their lunches. Maybe the dog also has mild separation anxiety and is like anticipating departures. But then once everybody kind of comes home and things are settled, then they're less anxious. So that's one reason. I mean, there's a whole host of things that could be going on. Um, if it hasn't eaten overnight and it's got too much acid on its stomach um, and maybe has a belly ache, and that's why they are, you know, more anxious because they're more irritable. So lots of different things. Definitely make sure that you're ruling out any sort of medical issue with your veterinarian um, and then potentially addressing that um, with a veterinary behaviorist to help uh, minimize that stress um, during that time frame. Um, okay, Kay's 16-week-old puppy is super energetic and generally fearless until the humans leave. She has tried peanut butter Kongs and working on desensitization. Yeah. Do you ever recommend meds or products to complement training for puppies or are they too young? No, they are absolutely not 
too young. I have done um, medication as young as six and eight weeks of age in puppies. Um, and now is the time we need to intervene sooner rather than later because we don't grow out of our anxiety or issues. We grow into them. Um, and if the sort of standards of, you know, leaving them with a, a frozen stuffed Kong and, um, you know, trialing short departures, if that's not working, then you really need to address that um, right away. And especially too with hopefully things opening up a bit with COVID um, and maybe going back to work here soon. Um, I, I kind of hate throwing in our videos, but I can't help it. I love it. Uh, Tracy Krulik, who is a separation anxiety certified trainer, and all she works on now is separation anxiety. She did a webinar for us that, again, you will find on the videos page. Um, I think it's called After COVID uh, Separation Anxiety, I don't know. I, I can't tell you the exact title right now, but you'll you'll see it. Yeah. It's not on the first page on that videos thing. Keep going. There are four pages of videos there. Yeah, and her um, her mentor, Milena Demartini, who's uh, developed the Certified Separation Anxiety Trainer Certification, um, has a program for owners called Mission Possible, and um, it's kind of a webinar-ish style. Um, how to go about the training piece of um, separation anxiety training. But a lot of what uh, this particular questioner said is, you know, leaving them with something high value, working on short departures, blah, blah, blah. Um, when that doesn't work, that is absolutely when um, we need to intervene with medications or products. I'd love to know about these new uh, programs. Yeah. I'll throw them on our website. Perfect. Um, Steve would like you to say the names of the four dog foods you recommended slowly. Okay. So Purina, um, they have two lines that are sort of their premium lines. We have their pro plan and their focus line. And then we have um, Royal Canin or Royal Canin is how we Americans say it, but it's a French company. So it's Canin. Um, and then Hills Science Diet. Those are the top four recommended um, uh, diets by veterinarians and veterinary nutritionists. I thought Hill was, hmm, is it all Hill diets that, that you Hill science diet are, are all fine, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Is clonidine safe for daily use? It absolutely is. So the nice thing about clonidine is it can be used max dose four times a day for the rest of the patient's life. There do not seem to be any sort of long-term um, issues with that. What are the drugs that FDA has approved for fear aggression? None. So there are, there are literally no drugs approved for use in aggression. Um, so everything that we're using for aggression is off label, but that's the number one thing that I treat. And one of the number one components of that treatment is medication. So, so, but we're using it off label. Do dogs get depression? <laughs> that's a really good question. We don't, we don't think that they, um, you know, truly have depression like we do. Um, but that's hard to say because I can't ask them, right. Um, there are certain criteria when it comes to human diagnoses, even like PTSD, um, while we recognize what we think is probably PTSD in our um, companion animals, I can't ask them if they are obsessing over a traumatic event. And, and so since I can't ask them if they're doing that, truly classically, we can't diagnose them as having what we call PTSD in humans. Um, and the same is true with depression. So while I see patients that sort of act like a depressed person would, um, we classify it more as fear, anxiety, or stress. And Dr. Pike did do a webinar on PTSD in dogs and where you can find it. <laughs> yeah, that's there too. Um, my dog can be crate reactive. Another dog walks by and she goes ballistic. I cover the crate but it's still quite disturbing to the other dog owner. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure where this crate's located that 
But anyway, yeah, it sounds like maybe it's like an agility, maybe agility trial maybe. or, you know, something like that, which is really common. So a lot of people that have dogs with those types of concerns, they oftentimes will crate in their car um, and they get, you know, make sure that obviously the car is at a good temperature. They keep the back door open and, you know, sit out there with the dog. But, you know, you can cover it. You can put some, a white noise machine right there, but that means you're too close to their trigger of another dog walking by their crate. So you need to get some distance. So you need a crate somewhere else. This same dog charges the outdoor fence very aggressively when another dog or person goes by. Mm -hmm. Try calling her off, but not always successfully. Yeah. So it sounds like they have a lot of territorial um, component to their aggression. And so, um, you know, you can train that call off, but it sounds like it's too intense, perhaps. And so we may need um, you know, intervention as far as like medication, because that emotion is way too strong for them. Um, also, if you look at the archives of our newsletters, the last one that went out was why I don't walk my dogs in my neighborhood. I love that. <laughs> and part of it was had to do with dogs that charge the fence. And she gave the comparison of if you were taken for a walk and some person screamed at you every time you went by, <laughs> what would it do to you? How would you feel? And why would you keep walking past that house? Exactly. exactly. Now, um, if you get a chance, go on the archives and, and read that article. And you just don't want to leave your, your dog out there where where your dog can do that. Yeah. Keep Just for your dog, but for everybody else and everyone else's dogs. Dogs can become reactive when another dog is constantly aggressive yep. toward them. So absolutely. That's a little tricky. <laughs> oh, oh, wait a minute. That must be an answer. My dog. All right. Now I'm getting a, okay, does Prozac efficacy decrease over time? It does not. Um, so if you have seen a lack of ef efficacy over time, it means that the disorder itself has worsened. Um, they may need a, a different dose. They may need a different medication. Um, but we can also see um, change in efficacy when you change the brand of the uh, pill. So let's say you're using one, like the Tiva brand of the generic fluoxetine, and you switch to um, another manufacturer. Tiva is just a really common one. So I know it, let's say Pfizer, um, generic fluoxetine, then you actually can see a difference between those two because it's all about bioavailability when it comes to psychoactive medications. So, so I always ask if you know, if owners say all of a sudden things have gone back to where they were before, the first thing that I ask them is, did you fill your prescription and did it look different? Like, was it a capsule versus a tablet or a different mm -hmm. um, tablet color or size? Um, because just changing the manufacturer can be a huge issue. Yeah, it's true with people too. Yeah, exactly. Me. Um, yeah. Why not hand feed resource guarding puppies? Because if they are already resource guarding, you are likely to push them over threshold by hand feeding them. So actually the best thing that you can do is um, just put them behind a closed door, leave them alone to eat their meal in peace. And once they have become comfortable with that whole situation, then you can work on some resource guarding training, but that is not I hand feed them. That is I, from a distance away where the dog is not resource guarding, I actually toss them an amazing, um, you know, food item, like a piece of chicken or a meatball as I walk by, um, teaching them that my presence actually brings better things, not worse things. So I don't recommend hand feeding any puppy because I think that puts such pressure on these animals um, and often induces resource guarding. Sounds like we need a webinar on resource guard. I would agree. It does sound like that. There were I, I didn't think it was as big an issue as, as I yeah. guess. It is. Um, okay. If I can pronounce it, I was under the impression that mycotoxin poisoning was more of an issue with kibble diets than mite allergies. 
that all all of that is possibility. So anytime that we're um, that we're storing any sort of any food, you know, you can get pest infestations, mite um, mite stuff. You can get the mycotoxins. Um, it, it's a possibility, just like with our flour, right? Like we can get um, little weevils and stuff in it as we store it. So we want to make sure that we store it in a sealed container and that's going to eliminate those types of issues. Okay. Um, do you think brown or white noise would be good to plug in near the front door or window for a dog that reacts to noises on the sidewalk as people walk by, he can't absolutely. outside. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly where I would put the white noise machine. Suggestions for encouraging eating food while on anxiety meds. Yeah, so uh, that is the number one um, side effect that we see is that appetite suppression. And number one, check with your veterinarian because if it is so severe that um, the dog is refusing, you know, meals in a row or has lost weight, it may be an inappropriate medication for that animal, or it may be a too high of a starting dose um, or dose change. But, you know, you can mix in, um, I often tell clients to do like craft powdered Parmesan cheese because it's stinky, but it coats all the kibbles really nicely. You can do canned dog food during that time. Um, oftentimes, if you put some, uh, you know, chicken broth and actually warm it up in the microwave, making it um, warmer um, and it can entice animals. I've even gone so far as doing cat food, canned cat food mixed in with the kibble because um, cat food is really stinky and um, dogs, the more it smells, the more dogs like it. So, mm -hmm. so definitely um, encourage them to eat in any way that you can. But generally, that's a very... Um, should be a mild side effect. And if it's not, again, talk to your vet, but, and it's one that they should power through over a few weeks time. So it's not something that should remain for the rest of their time on that medication. And if it is, you need to talk to your veterinarian. Should dogs be left food to eat overnight? I don't recommend it. So I'm a big proponent of meal feeding and you get 20, 30 minutes with your meal. And if you haven't eaten it, it gets put away. Number one, so we don't have something to resource guard there. Number two, so you don't track ants into your house. Um, and, you know, if you're using canned food, you don't want that to stay out because that can spoil. Um, so there are a lot of different reasons why I wouldn't leave food um, out overnight um, just from that perspective. Here's an interesting one. How can you prevent dog reactivity in a new puppy when your older dog is reactive and so avoids meeting other dogs on walks? Yeah, actually, I don't recommend that any dog meet another dog on leash, period. So um, that is a very American thing that we do. And, and no other culture um, does leash greetings with dogs, interestingly enough. So because dogs can be frustrated greeters and that frustration of I want to go greet him, I want to go greet him, I want to go greet him actually can then turn into reactivity as they get older. Um, so I recommend that we teach the dog to actually ignore another dog or do what we call look at that where you see another dog, you look to me to get a treat, and we move on with our walk. Um, if your older dog is reactive to other dogs and is barking and lunging, I wouldn't walk them together because they, they can absolutely feed off of one another. Um, you had mentioned a chew toy that you like better than the Kong. Oh, yeah, a topple. topple. Yep. Yeah, we carry those. Yeah, they're fun. So you can also have different sizes. You can put one inside another. Yep. And yep. Yeah, it would be, yeah. My dogs are smarter than I am. <laughs> um, okay. Someone else wanted the names of the food again. Um, Kathy, if you have those, can you put them up? If you don't, then um, then I can put them up. Uh, there are a lot of thank yous. Let's see. You're, You're no longer ugh, recommending Iams Yukonuba products. So Iams Yukonuba actually is owned by Royal Canin. So um, any of the Royal Canin um, products, Iams and Yukonuba is one of those. And how do you spell Canin? Is what someone asked. Canin, C-A-N-I-N. So it's like canine without the E. Oh, 
Okay. And you can find all four of those that I mentioned at like PetSmart, Petco, Chewy. Royal Companion. Royal Canaan. No, no, no. Royal oh. Canyon, the pet store. Oh, I don't know. There used to be a bunch of pet stores and now almost all of them are loyal. I know. They all went away. I know. It was really sad. Um, they probably have it, I would think. Okay. Oh, yeah. Now people answered that, how to spell it. Um, for the topple, if you get a small one and a large, never mind, they're just telling them you can nest <laughs> the other or you can just use one. Let me see where there's. I love how everyone's trying to help everyone. It's great. Right. And Kathy's putting in all of these links. Oh, cool. Different things, which is Hi, really. Kathy. Are there Hills science diet food that aren't prescription? Yes, I've absolutely. Prescription yeah. for the low fat land kind. Yeah, there's a ton of over the counter um, diet. All of all four of those are, are over the counter. Three of those have veterinary diets. Uh, a veterinary line of diets. Um, but yeah, you can find all of those over the counter. So, you know, they'll have a small breed, medium breed, large breed. Um, Royal Canaan actually has breed specific diets um, because certain breeds have certain health issues that we can actually help prevent with nutrition. Um, so like mini schnauzer, um, it's going to have some stuff to prevent uh, pancreatitis and um, urinary stones and all that kind of stuff. Since Kirkland has multiple dog foods, does your recommendation against Kirkland include Kirkland's signature healthy weight formula, chicken and vegetable? And what is it about Kirkland that makes you not recommend it? Yeah, so the biggest thing with um, foods is number one, you want to make sure that they are AFCO certified. So that's a, that is a voluntary certification that pet food companies can get, which means they have outside testing of their products and what they say is on the bag actually is in the bag. If they are not AFCO certified, they could put whatever the heck they want on that ingredient list. That doesn't mean that that's what's in the actual bag itself. Um, so that's the first thing. And I don't think Kirkland diets are um, AFCO certified. But the other thing is the, the research. Um, so those four products that I told you about, those four um, lines that I pro told you about, it, they are all doing research constantly to find out, you know, what is the best nutrient profile um, that we should use. And that's the other thing about them too, is that they are nutrient based not ingredient based. So we have certain nutrients that are animals and, and that we need. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's, um, you know, I hear people constantly complaining about like, well, it says chicken meal, um, not, you know, whole chicken. Well, actually chicken meal is probably one of the more nu nutrient rich parts of the chicken um, that uh, they're using. And so it's a, it's really going to be focused on, are we getting the best nutrition um, versus the type of ingredient that, that causes that good nutrition. So that's, that's, um, it's a very controversial topic, I will say, but if you ask your veterinarian, they are likely to recommend one of those four lines. Where is the certification? Is it small or? It's, it, it's going to depend on the product. I think Royal Canins is like the bottom right of the bag. They put it on the front, um, but it should say AFCO certified on there. This while, during this webinar, I sent my husband down and said, hey, look at our bag. And said, <laughs> I don't see it, but it could be there. So I'll go look. Um, for an anxious dog, do you recommend canned food instead of kibble? And if so, any particular brands? No, I don't, I, I'm not going to recommend canned over kibble just for anxiety. Um, so no. Um, by the way, with all these questions, unfortunately, it's not going to be until spring, but we are having someone who is a trainer and a nutrition expert who's going to be on talking about how food affects behavior and giving suggestions for, for healthy eating for your dog. I mean, it would be good for you too, but <laughs> you notice weight loss on dogs on reconcile who are eating their normal amounts and show good appetite. Um, that's always possible, especially if they're getting um, increased uh, exercise because maybe, you know, they're not as reactive. So people are able to take them 
for long, longer walks, but it doesn't increase your metabolism naturally. So it's something about calorie intake and calorie output has changed. As there's a lot of discussion regarding diet. Yeah, like I said, it is a very controversial topic. Yeah, <laughs> forever dog. Yeah. What's, for, what's forever dog? That's, may I ask what you think of Dr. Karen Becker's new book, Forever Dog? No, I'm not, I'm not a fan. And if you ask 99 veterinarians out of 100, they aren't either. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, we still need to post the four food lines if anybody can do that. I'm just going to try to get through some more of these questions. Um, Oh, well, okay. I have not seen Royal Canaan veterinary formulas in breed size versions like their retail line has. Yeah. The veterinary it version kibble is too large for very small dogs. Is there a substantial difference between the veterinary calm and the small breed comfort care? Um, that's a really good question that I actually don't know the answer to. Um, you would have to call the Royal Canaan, um, like their 800 number customer service. Cause I don't know what the, I know that the comfort care has similar active ingredients to the calm diet, but I don't, um, I, I don't know if it's the same exact, um, formulation. So Okay. Gosh, they're such good. Somebody wrote, this isn't a question, but I just want to show you what, I, I don't know who these people are. Other diets make sure that foods follow AFCO guidelines for percent protein, et cetera, but they don't do feeding trials on their diets. The big four do. Yep. Thank you. Whoever that was. Yep. You're exactly right. Okay. We have got to, um, Mention the four again. That keeps coming up. Okay. Um, it's Hill Science Diet. So that's the same. Uh, you'll find it under Hills or Science Diet, depending on what the actual thing is. Um, Purina's Pro Plan line, Purina's Focus line, and Royal Canaan. And like the other person had said, Imes and Yukonuba both are Royal Canaan um, brands now. They have they have since bought um, that line, I guess, from Procter and Gamble. Um, and so any of the Imes and Yukonubas are are also Royal Canaan diets, and I recommend those too. There's a follow up question for the the dog way. The question about the the person who had the reactive fence charging, mm -hmm. you know, and and in the crate also, what type of behavioral training would help her most? Yeah, so it's it's definitely going to be teaching her an alternate incompatible behavior. So if you can't um, you can't bark and charge the fence if you are sitting quietly in the yard, um, and so we're going to have to teach, and that may mean that again that threshold is too much um, for your particular pet and they may need some sort of product or medication intervention in order to train that um, because the stimulus is too intense, uh, you know, someone walking by the fence or walking by the, um, the crate. Um, Angie wants to know, what is the best way to introduce my dog to new people or approach people in general. He's a rescue and is skittish and tends to bark more at men. Yeah, so you're gonna need to make sure that, um, again, the animal's under threshold and you're gonna wanna work on desensitizing them and using food to classically counter condition them. So, so the person needs to be far enough away that your dog's not skittish, nervous, or reactive. Um, they need to make themselves as small as possible. So sometimes turning sideways to that, um, to your pet, and then, uh, either you feeding food or having them toss food towards them, um, that they can get so that you're also associating, um, the presence of that person with, 
um, good things. And that is, that is definitely something that if you don't feel like you have the skill level to accomplish, number one, you need to find a trainer, a positive reinforcement based trainer that can help you. Um, or if the stimulus is too intense and there's no distance that keeps your pet under threshold, that's when you need the help of your veterinarian or your veterinary behaviorist to, um, prescribe some sort of medication or products. Um, what I would like is if you would explain something about your practice. You've got, I mean, you have trainers. Yeah. And you have veterinary behaviors. Do, can yeah. people see the trainers while they wait to see you? Do they see you first and you refer to your trainers? Yeah. So, yeah, it kind of depends. I mean, unfortunately with COVID, um, pre-COVID, we were booked to, I was booked two weeks in advance to see a new patient. Um, I'm now booked four and a half months out. Um, and months? Months. Not weeks, months. Not weeks, months. Um, and so, and that is true of all of my colleagues. We are way, way much more booked now. Um, so we have a phone consult option with our trainers that you can talk to one of our trainers first and um, they can help you implement management and basic behavior modification um, before you can come in and see one of the doctors. We also have um, emergency slots available. So if somebody cancels, um, sort of last minute for whatever reason, then we open that slot up for an emergency appointment. Um, and we also have a wait list. So if an emergency appointment doesn't fill it, um, then we work through our wait list. And sometimes we're able to get people in sooner, but typically they're going to see me, me or one of my doctors first. Um, and then they will um, meet with the nurses for medication follow-up. Um, and then they'll meet with the trainers for trainer follow-up if they're not already working with a qualified trainer that we trust. So you don't have to work with one of my trainers to be a, to be a client of ours. In fact, we get a lot of um, direct referrals from trainers themselves and we send you back to your trainer as long as they are qualified um, and capable of helping you through that, that behavior concern. What would happen after a phone consult with the trainer? Is it only like a one-time thing? It's a one-time thing. It's a 30-minute um, phone consult. They send you a write-up of everything you talked about, what management strategies they recommended, videos, um, you know, for some of the more simple behavior modification things. Um, and then most of our phone consultations also are um, already have an appointment scheduled with one of the doctors. They just kind of need to know what to do in the meantime. Um, and so that's what the focus is going to be on. Yeah, because a lot of trainers now, too, there's so many new COVID dogs that they're backed up. They're backed up. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So if you're thinking, people, that you need help, think ahead. Don't don't think I will wait three weeks and see if it goes <laughs> away. If you have a problem now, you're going to have a problem in three weeks. And chances are you won't get in to see a trainer that quickly anyway. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so don't, um, don't, yeah. Don't delay. <laughs> um, oh, here's another. What are your thoughts on the pack leader trainer approach? Uh, it's a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> Dogs aren't pack animals, first of all. They're, um, that's a myth. Um, they also don't create dominance hierarchies with people. So no animal in the animal kingdom creates dominance hierarchies with any other species of animal. Um, and so it is not about being the alpha, about, you know, trying to get my dog integrated as, you know, as a pack member with these other dogs to train it appropriately. That's not how dog behavior works. So now, for those of you with dogs between, let's see, five months and two years, maybe, our next webinar, which will be next weekend, but on Sunday, is Surviving the Teenage Years. <laughs> a lot, we're, what we're hearing is that a lot of people who got dogs and didn't know what to expect have these cute puppies and then they become teenagers and the owners are freaking out yep. because they don't know what's going on. Yeah. Just like children who become teenagers, it is a whole other ball game. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. so, you know, if, if you're in that situation or if you're about to have a dog who's going to be a little older, 
Yeah. It'll be really helpful to come to that webinar. See, the trainers are booked and the veterinary behaviorists are booked, but the webinars are available. The webinars are free and available. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we have them. I know. And you guys do such a donate work. on our homepage. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Pike. This was you're a welcome, Deborah. review. And uh, now your staff also. Yeah. Look what the six M's are, which <laughs> and it's not martinis. <laughs> well, meatballs. I didn't have meatballs. A, I used to work. Yeah. yeah, I used to get frozen meatballs and I could break them off. I re, you know defrost some and I can break off small pieces with my yep. with my fingernail. Yep. We love the frozen meatballs too. So that's yeah. why they kept joking. <laughs> it must be meatballs. <laughs> okay. Well right, everybody. thank you. Lots of thanks from everybody who was here. Uh, and I will see you next time. Okay. Thanks for coming. Take care.